Ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, in his out is, and of course, in between us, my name's Dan. Welcome back to another Pat Reports. It's Thursday, June the 25th, 2020. PC Richard Hoskin, Hoskin Johns from Devon and Cornwall Police has resigned just one day before his misconduct hearing. Johns is said to have had intimate relationships with two vulnerable women whom he met as a police constable and a third woman who is not described as vulnerable but took the time off work to meet them all. Johns, who is married and was at the time, is also alleged to have made untrue comments about colleagues, suggesting that they were trying to stitch him up. It was revealed that Johns told the women to lie if they were ever asked questions about their relationship by the force's professional standards investigators. After his suspension over the investigation, it's alleged he contacted women asking them to deny everything and tell investigators to fuck off. The hearing at Devon and Cornwall Forces HQ in Exeter was also told the, that he access, accessed the police computer systems in relation to one of the women for a non-policing purpose. The former constable, who was based at Helstead in Cornwall, is accused of breaching the standards of honesty and integrity, authority, respect and courtesy, orders and instructions, duties and responsibilities, confidentiality and discreditable conduct. Gone for the full house. The case is due to last three days and the panel has to determine whether the former officer committed misconduct, gross misconduct or neither. The hearing should now be over and I will endeavour to contact the force to find out the outcome. 44 year old PC Philip Smallcombe from South Wales Police or rather ex PC Philip Smallcombe is facing nine allegations over the fact that he worked for a funeral service whilst he was signed off work sick. Smallcombe's misconduct hearing, which he didn't attend due to ill health, no doubt, <laughs> found that six of the nine allegations were gross misconduct, one was misconduct, one not proven and another withdrawn. Smallcombe, who resigned in March 2019, is said to have led the funeral cortege for hearses at funerals for Park Funeral Services in Pontypridd, Wales between 2015 and 2016. The misconduct panel said that Smallcombe would have been sacked had he not resigned over the allegations of discreditable, discreditable conduct and breaching standards of professional behaviour. And South Wales Police are applying for him to be put on the College of Police Bard list to prevent him working in law enforcement in the future. Police were turning people away from Formby Beach in Merseyside yesterday, which was, at that point, the hottest day of the year so far, unless today's temperature has beaten that, as a preventative measure to help enforce COVID advice. In fact, Police stress that the new changes to social distancing rules do not come into effect until July the 4th. How strange for the police to do their preventative policing over things that are potentially safer and genuinely will make people happier rather than over the illegal type of mass gatherings which they seem more happier to allow. Merseyside Police posted on Twitter, Officers are dispersing a gathering on Formby Beach and will remain in the area to turn away anyone planning to attend, as well as patrolling the Sefton coast for the safety of everyone, gatherings of more than six people are still not permitted. But yet, we're turning people away before they even knew if they were going to be in a group of more than six people or not. Sounds a bit like minority report to me. And wouldn't it be nice if they used that power for actual good and stop some of the actual criminals? I'm sure this won't be the only police force trying to control you still, so be aware when you're out heading somewhere nice to enjoy the weather and remember, there's only a few instances where the police can actually prevent you from doing something for the prevention of crime and stopping you from going to the beach isn't one of them. The next story isn't police related per se, but as a dog owner, I wanted to add this as I feel I've got a bit of a responsibility uh, with the reach that I have on this channel. Dogs are suffering in this extreme heat and we have a responsibility to help protect them from owners who are causing suffering and in some cases death of the pets from by taking them out for walks during the hottest parts of the day or leaving them in vehicles to bake in the extreme heat. A dog in a car can suffer even if it's not the hottest part of the day as dogs only need a few degrees heat increase to cause severe trauma. A spokesperson from the RSPCA said the RSPCA continually urges owners never to leave dogs in a hot car, vehicle, caravan, conservatory or outbuilding in the warm weather. Dogs and other pets can overheat and die if left in a hot environment such as a car as temperatures can rapidly rise in a matter of minutes with lethal consequences for pets. Each summer the RSPCA is part of a coalition of organisations and charities to run the Dogs Die in Hot Cars campaign urging owners never to leave their pets in hot environments such as cars, caravans, conservatories and advising members of the public what to do if they spot a car on a, in a car on a warm day. 
There are always tragic cases of dogs dying in cars or because they've been walked in extreme heat and people need to remember that no dog suffered because it missed a walk, okay? But they will suffer if you take them and they have no way to cool down when they get too hot. If you do see a dog or any other animal in a car, and that includes pigs, whether the car is in direct sun, where the windows are not open enough for a real cool breeze and where there is no water for the animal, please don't ignore it. Call the police, call the RSPCA, or if you can, try and take action yourself without breaking any laws. But remember, allowing an animal to suffer is a criminal offence, and that could mean seeing an animal suffer and taking no action to prevent it. Now, I know this next story is a controversial one and will spark opposing opinions in the comments, but I had to add it as people need to know the law about this particular type of incident. A woman called the police in Southport on Monday, 22nd of June, after accusing a man of taking pictures of a two-year-old who was playing by a fountain. The woman was said to have called the police after she challenged the photographer who she claimed on Facebook openly admitted to taking the photos. Merseyside police said that it was established he had been taking images of the fountain and took a photo when the girl ran into the shot. The man had deleted the image following a request from the child's mother which was checked by officers and he was given advice about conduct and perceptions by officers. A friend of the child's mother posted to Facebook to others to be vigilant, although her account of events differed from those of the police with the friend of the woman claiming the man was deliberately taking photos of the child. Now I agree that everyone should remain vigilant. There are too many pervs and pedos out there and we need to protect our children. However, we need to be proportionate in how we react. And I don't mean a police kind of proportionate. If someone is taking pictures in a public place, there is no expectation of privacy, unless in very few circumstances where you would expect some level, such as a cash machine, for example. But running around the streets playing in a fountain in a heavy footfall area, for example, is not somewhere you're likely to expect any level of privacy. There is no law to prevent people taking photos or of anything or anyone in such an area, including children. As much as people may not like that idea, it is the exact reason why police and councils are allowed to have CCTV cameras watching you and your children. Difference is, you don't know who's watching you or your kids on CCTV, whereas you can see the person taking pictures in the street. And just because the camera may appear to be facing you or your children, it doesn't mean that you or them are the focus of the images. Pictures of children are only illegal if they are inappropriate images, which clearly the ones this guy was taking weren't, as the police didn't arrest him. I don't believe there is anything wrong with asking someone politely about their pictures, but you should remember there is no legal reason for someone to tell you what they're doing or show you the pictures. You need to remember also that photographers do not need your permission to take a photo of you in a public place. They do not need a release form. They do not need to show you their images and you cannot force anyone to delete images. These are the same rules as for the police asking photographers to do the same. Kicking off and making threats or false accusations are likely to result in two things. You getting frustrated and a photographer getting their back up and refusing to engage with you. Please stop jumping to conclusions and making up sordid, paranoid, pretend situations in your mind. Speak to the photographers with some respect and stay calm. This isn't going to work all the time, but some photographers will engage with you and speak to them if you speak to them in a respectful manner rather than accusing them of doing something terrible. If you are genuinely concerned and not simply being a highly strung worrier, then call the police. But only do so if you have genuine concerns, as you could well be wasting your time and wasting the police time when they could be dealing with genuine crimes. Also, making accusations on social media as to the motives of photographers could very well land you in trouble as well for libel. So please try to engage with people properly, or if your child is properly dressed to be in public, then stop worrying because it's unlikely any of the images are going to be indecent. I know this is a subject that gets opinions from both sides, so let me know what you think in the comments. Apparently, police chiefs have admitted that their rush to publish data on lockdown fights may have led to an understatement of how many were given to those from the Bain community, but denied the understatement hid a deeper problem of racism. National Police Chief Council Chairperson Martin Hewitt said it does not and that's unfair. This came in very quickly and we brought the data from all forces into one place and decided to be open with it every two weeks. We made corrections and are now analysing the data and we will be confident in what it tells us. Chair of the Home Affairs Committee Yvette Cooper said she, really, she was really shocked 
police chiefs didn't have accurate data collection and analysis at the start of the lockdown in March, when police began handing out fines for lockdown breaches. Data available, pub available publicly would suggest that Bain people are apparently at least 50% more likely to have received fixed penalty notices over COVID regulations than us whiteys. Although I do find myself asking, is this to do with the fact that the issuers of the fixed penalty notices are discriminating, or is it to do with more the fact that Bain community are those breaching the regulations more, which could explain the higher amount of fixed penalty notices issued to them. Besides, the figures aren't exactly hugely opposing. Between the 27th of March and 8th of June, it suggested that the number of fines handed out to white people was about 20 per 100,000 in the population, but for those from Bain backgrounds, it was 30 per 100,000 people. Mr Hewitt was also challenged by MPs over the use of police stop and search powers, which have historically been used more against people from Bain backgrounds. He denied an accusation that police forces who have been given more stop and search powers were addicted to its use. <laughs> of course they're addicted to using it. That's why the police lie about smelling cannabis. It's simply a tool that the police use on everyone, not just the Bain community. I don't deny that there are people out there in the police who will discriminate, but I personally think that many of the police will use the tools to and issue FPNs to anyone who simply refuses to bow down to their authority. And from what, I've, what I see often, there's many people from the BAME community who refuse to bow down to the police's authority. But again, that's an opinion based on what I see, whereas other people may see things differently. A review into an incident in Hackney by the Metropolitan Police's Professional Standards Department has found that there was no misconduct in the behaviour of the police involved. An arrest in Hackney, which was filmed by a local resident, shows a man being what some have called punched while restrained on the ground after police were called to reports of a man racially abusing staff in a bank. The man, who mainstream media report as being unidentified but yet seemed to know his age is 43, was arrested on suspicion of a racially aggravated public order offence. A Metropolitan Police spokesperson said that during the arrest the man attempted to bite police. While the police did not confirm how many officers became involved in the arrest, at least 10 can be seen arriving as a crowd gathers around the man being restrained. The spokesperson for youth-led police monitoring group Hackney Account has said that the release of body-worn uh, camera footage is difficult due to data protection issues, but stressed the importance of the police providing a frame-by-frame -frame explanation of what is happening and do that in an objective way. Which I think, for one, is a great idea. I think that any police complaint that's captured on video should be di dissected by the police constables involved, explaining on record, frame by frame, what was happening. The group went on to call for a transparent conversation about what constitutes a reasonable use of force, specifically in reference to the punch, as well as a genu generally independent scrutiny panel with community buy-in and representation. Now, whether it was a punch or whether it was the attempt not to be bitten is unclear as there are people standing in the way, but although I don't agree with excessive force being used on anyone, we have to be careful not to eliminate the police's use of force completely. The same force as we as the public are allowed to use in the same situations, as I think we're going to find that police will start to second guess themselves when dealing with incidents. That's likely to lead to delays in action being taken, which could lead to members of the public being injured by criminals because the police are frightened of being called out for excessive force. In this particular situation, though, I do think there were enough police to be able to control the guy as he was handcuffed. And so I'm not saying this wasn't excessive. I'm simply saying that it's unclear from the footage. And if we simply start calling all police force excessive, it's going to lead to many people getting away with hurting others due to the police's reluctance to step in and stop it. I think the review of body worn video footage and a frame by frame explanation on the record is a great idea for every complaint against the police. And this should be publicly accessible as it will allow more transparency and in order for the police, uh, for everyone to hold the police to account. But I doubt very much this will ever happen outside of closed doors because the police are more concerned about the reputation of the police force than actually showing how bent some of the coppers are. Police Constable Rebecca Latham of Ilford Avenue in Crosby appeared at Liverpool Magistrates Court on Tuesday over allegations that she caused serious injury by dangerous driving. 26-year-old Latham pleaded not guilty to the charge that she caused serious injury to fellow PC Kamel Toomey on December 4th last year. It was said that Latham was driving along Formby Bypass when the accident occurred. After pleading not guilty, the magistrate admitted the case to Liverpool Crown Court due to the seriousness of the offence. Latham was released on unconditional bail ahead of her appearance 
on July the 21st. Jake Heppel, the man who claimed responsibility for the White Lives Matter banner stunt over the Etihad Stadium, has been sacked by the firm Paradigm Precision, even though the police said that there was no criminal offences committed. 24-year-old Jake worked for the company who make gas turbine engines. The company said in a statement that they do not condone or tolerate racism of any form. But if this was a racist act, then surely police would have been all over it as a hate crime. Jake said, the police told me that I haven't committed any crime and haven't done anything wrong. In fact, they asked me if I was okay and wanted any protection just in case people tried to target me. But doesn't that just simply go to show that the police are more afraid of the BLM supporters who are making a fuss about the stunt? People who claim to be peacefully protesting against discrimination, but yet their police are worried that they might target him. He said, we are not trying to offend the movement or black people. I believe that it's also important to acknowledge that white lives matter too. That's all we were trying to say. Yesterday, we spoke about Sergeant Michael Grigg, who was in Oxford Magistrates Court over the allegations of sexual activity with a child, which allegedly took place between 2007 and 2012. It would appear that he has pleaded not guilty as after speaking to the court this morning, his hearing has been sent to Harrow Crown Court, the date of which is to be confirmed. Griggs remains on conditional bail until his appearance and is still suspended from duties. I will of course try and keep you updated on that case when more information becomes available. Yesterday, we also spoke about PC Stephen Dalton, a Hertfordshire constable who had appeared at St Albans Magistrates Court over allegations of actual bodily harm following an IOPC investigation after a member of the public reported serious injuries to his face. Following his arrest in Watford on October 4th, 2019, Dalton's hearing has also been sent for trial at St Albans Crown Court, which will be heard on July 27th. Big thank you to the channel Patreon supporters. Your support is much appreciated, as is everybody who likes, comments, shares and subscribes. And that's all I have for you today. Please like, share, comment and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts, as I know many of you will. And until next time, stay safe, look after each other, film the police, film other officials, and go and enjoy this weather while we have it. Good night, all. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you like the content and you'd like to help support the channel, you can do so. In the description of every video, there are some links to ways that you're able to help support the channel so I can continue putting out content. If you're unable to help us in that way, hit that subscribe button up the top there. If you haven't already, become a subscriber. That is support enough. Share the videos, comment, like, it all helps. If you're looking for something else to watch, up top there is my latest video. Down the bottom there is a video that YouTube recommends for you.